out of a population of 14 million. All it's right, we're going to need to go now as we hear the Prime Minister. Thank you, Doctor. Extend by 30 days the current measures in place along the border. This is an important decision that will keep people in both of our countries safe. I can confirm that Canada and the United States have agreed to extend for 30 days the measures at the borders that are already in place. It's a very important decision that will protect people on both sides of the border. I also want to address the tragic RCAF plane crash in Kamloops over the weekend. My thoughts and the thoughts of all Canadians are with the families of Captain Casey, Captain McDougall, and the entire Snowbirds team. This has been a very difficult few weeks for members of the Canadian Armed Forces. As we mourn, we remember Captain Casey as a proud Nova Scotian and an outstanding servicewoman, a journalist who turns her, her turned her talents to the forces. She will be remembered not just for her professionalism, but for her sense of humor and for her kindness. As we honor her, we pay tribute to the bravery of all those who serve today. Our women and men in uniform are always there for us, serving overseas to defend the values we hold dear, working here at home to care for our seniors and lift our spirits with flyovers. So to everyone who so proudly wears the maple leaf, thank you. You do your country proud today and every day. After this tragedy of the RCAF that happened this weekend, Canadians are with all our, with the family of Captain Casey and Captain McDougall and all the team of Snowbirds at a time where we are crying the decease of another hero. We have to salute the bravery of the men and women that are in uniform. As we start to carefully and gradually reopen our economy, a lot of people will be wondering what that means for them. If you've been laid off, you're probably waiting to see whether your employer will start up your workplace and rehire you. To help them do that, we've extended the wage subsidy through the summer. This is about getting people back to work and giving businesses the confidence to re reopen, rehire, and even grow. Because the way our economy will recover and the way our country will remain resilient and successful is by getting Canadians back to work. Many business owners are already benefiting from this program to rehire and maintain the crucial link between workplace and employee. To employers looking to start up again, please rehire your workers. Use the wage subsidy for their paycheck. That's what it's there for. And for businesses that still need help, today we're taking another step forward. Today I can announce that we are expanding the eligibility of the Canada Emergency Business Account. If you are the sole owner-operator of a business, if your business relies on contractors, or if you have a family-owned business and you pay employees through dividends, you will now qualify. For example, for a hair salon owner with stylists who rent chairs, for a local physiotherapist, for an independent gym owner with contracted trainers, this is for you. We'll have more details very soon about when you'll be able to apply. But we heard you when you said you needed a hand. That's why Minister Ng is also working on potential solutions to help business owners and entrepreneurs who operate through their personal bank account as opposed to a business account or have yet to file a tax return, such as newly created businesses. And, as we announced last week, there's new funding for regional development agencies too, which you can always contact if you still don't meet these expanded criteria. Businesses like yours are the backbone of our economy and the lifeblood of our communities. And whether it's with the SEBA or the expanded wage subsidy, we're in your corner. To help the owners of small enterprises to reopen, we are expanding the Canada Emergency Business Account. Already, 
more than 600,000 small enterprises add a loan of 40,000 on that program. But we know that there are even more people that need help. So if you're the sole owner of a company, if your company depends of contractual workers, or if you have a family enterprise and you pay your employees with dividends, you are now eligible. For instance, if you've got an air salon or you need some stylists that are renting some seats, if you're a physiotherapist that works for itself, if you're owner of a gym that employs some trainers under contract, this program is there for you. We are working hard to make sure that people keep their jobs or can go back to work. And we do it by helping the small businesses that are so important in our community, because this is how Canada will be able to recover strongly. Of course, so that we can go through this crisis, we must also have enough medical uh, equipment so people can stay healthy and safe. This morning, I'd like to uh, announce uh, on protection uh, equipment. O over the last few years, uh, weeks only, we had more masks and visors. This week and in the next few weeks, hundreds of thousands of personal equipment protection uh, will be available. They will be delivered to provinces and territories. We also have received a a, an order of respirators Zoll from the United States. And as much we want the, the material to be produced here, we are increasing our capacity of production. We now have 15 contracts across the country for personal protective equipment, uh, namely the robes that will be needed by the medical staff. Something we haven't had enough of lately. As of today, Canada now has its first university in the north. Yukon College is becoming the new Yukon University. And as a cornerstone for this step, our government has already provided $26 million for a new science building. To everyone who helped make this milestone happen, congratulations. Not just for students, but for all of us. This is truly something to celebrate. Young people have the power to change our country for the better, and it's up to us to make sure that no matter where they live, they have the tools to chase their dreams and succeed. Today, more than ever, we need their vision and their creativity, because that is our path forward. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. On va commencer la période des questions par le téléphone aujourd'hui. Opérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. Première question, Michel Lamarche, TVA. First question, à vous. Michel Lamarche from TVA. Monsieur Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau, first a question on the borders. Was there more pressure from the provinces to maintain the closure uh, till the end of June? Is it the same thing in the United States for uh, 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 Closer and their term. We spoke a lot with provinces over the last few weeks, and there was a clear desire to continue with the measures that we have right now at the borders. You know, there's a, this is a vulnerability. And in the cases of COVID that could uh, come from the outside of the country. So we will expand the measures that we have, and the Americans have been very open uh, to prolong for another 30 days. Of course, I'd like to hear you on the reopening of businesses in Montreal. Uh, you've got some worries of what's going on in Montreal. And who would you go shopping in Montreal? Uh, yesterday, I had a chance to discuss with many entrepreneurs, owners of small businesses in my circumscription uh, through internet uh, in a virtual manner. And I've heard uh, both their preoccupations, but also the desire to rehire 
uh, gradually uh, and with attention uh, for the economic activity. So I know that the various businesses across the island of Montreal and even across the country will take the good decisions, will be very careful. They say that, that there's many consumers, uh, and they, they want to, to go shopping again and help their local businesses. So we will have to do it in a very attentionate way to make sure that uh, we can reopen safely, gradually, and myself. Yes, I'd like to have a chance to go through various uh, businesses in the next few months, but uh, we have to follow uh, the counseling uh, of uh, health officials and make sure that we keep distanciation and we do only shopping if we need to. Thank you. Next question, Kate Bolangaro, Bloomberg, line open. Hi, Prime Minister. Um, so on this news regarding the uh, border extension, I am wondering um, when exactly will Canada open its international borders and do you foresee that there will be further extensions to this border closure beyond June 21st? As we've seen, the decisions that we're taking are very much uh, made uh, week to week in this crisis. The situation is changing rapidly and we're adjusting constantly to uh, what is uh, the right measures for Canadians to get that balance right between keeping people safe and restoring a semblance of normality and the economic activity that uh, we all rely on. Uh, we're going to keep making those decisions as time goes on. Uh, it was the right thing to to further extend by 30 days our closure of the Canada-US border to travelers other than uh, essential services and goods. Uh, but uh, we will continue to watch carefully what's happening uh, elsewhere in the world uh, and around us as we make decisions on next steps. Okay. Uh, that we recognize that it changes extremely quickly. The situation is evolving and we'll take decisions that are appropriate uh, at the time we are in. Uh, for now, it's important to prolong some restrictions for an extra 30 days with the American border. And in 30 days, we will have more discussions. We'll see what's happening elsewhere in the world, uh, elsewhere, everywhere in Canada, and we'll take the uh, decisions that are appropriate um, in, in time. Uh, each step, we have to take the good decision. As a follow-up, Kate? question regarding the LEAF program. So it seems that it's been delayed now that we're leaving mid-May when it was supposed to be open. So I'm wondering when will this rental subsidy program be unveiled and what's the holdup? Uh, we were pleased to announce a large employer's uh, emergency financing facility uh, a number of uh, number of days ago now. Uh, we're continuing to work with uh, industry, with various partners to fine-tune the program so it's the right thing. It is designed to be uh, a lender of last resort for many big employers. Uh, we know that big companies have greater access to capital than small businesses, which is why we help small businesses right away and very generously. But large companies can access borrowed capital on capital markets uh, around the world, uh, and uh, we hope they're going to be able to do that. But if they are unable to, the uh, LEAF will be there uh, to offer them support uh, to lend them money to get through this uh, COVID situation. We're continuing to work with them on making sure that it rolls out as quickly as possible. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Marika Walsh, The Globe and Mail. Line open. Hi, Prime Minister, thank you. I'm wondering if you can tell us what your approach is going to be on Keystone XL. What, if anything, can you do if uh, the Democratic candidate is going to cancel the project? A couple of years before becoming Prime Minister, I went down to Washington to advocate for the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, it has been a long position of mine uh, that we need to get our resources to new markets safety, safely and securely. And that's why I have always uh, advocated for the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, we uh, saw the previous Democratic administration cancel it. Uh, and we will continue to work uh, with uh, whatever government gets elected in the 
United States to impress upon them how important Canada is as a secure and reliable supply of energy uh, that they require even as we move forward to uh, a, a different future. Okay. Uh, I've defendu, uh, always defended the uh, Keystone Pipeline. Uh, two years before being elected uh, as Prime Minister, I went uh, to Washington to speak with Democrats to, for the importance of make sure that uh, the Canadian energy uh, can go through the United States. I, I want to work with whoever the government uh, that will be elected at the end of the American elections to uh, remind them as much that Canada is a reliable uh, source of energy if needed and we will continue to demonstrate that we're going forward responsibly by working with our partners. Yeah, so my question was though what, what you will do going forward. I, but I do want to pivot to Parliament. Um, Andrew Shear is calling for more in-person sittings. What is your position on, on how or when Parliament should return? I think, as as uh, with everything, we need to be cautious and responsible in how we uh, reopen and restart uh, all sectors of the Canadian economy. We understand that it is extremely important to have a strong democracy and strong institutions, uh, not in spite of the crisis, but because of the crisis. And that's why we've been very pleased with extremely effective virtual sittings uh, in, combined with in-person sittings over the past weeks that have allowed MP from every corner of the country to participate fully uh, in uh, asking questions in the work that uh, Parliament is doing. My concern is that uh, as we reopen, uh, if we reopen with reduced numbers without virtual sittings, there will be many, many MPs from further uh, parts of the country who will be unable or unwilling uh, to come uh, to Ottawa because of their family's safety, and therefore uh, there will be parts of the country that won't be reflected in our democratic institutions. Uh, we've put forward proposals that combine both virtual sittings and in-person sittings to continue the, the approach we have right now. We look to uh, con good conversations with other parties on uh, figuring out that right balance as we move forward safely in upholding the importance of our democracy. Thank you. Operator, dernière question au téléphone. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Mélanie Marquis, La Presse. From Mélanie Marquis, from La Presse. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, what changes have you brought to the deal with the Americans? For now, we have the same agreement that we had. There's always some little discussions to see if there's some little changes that must be made. But for now, it's the same accord. Follow up? Yes. This one of the uh, disposition is uh, about the uh, people who are requesting asylum. Uh, is that still on? And, uh, do you intend to ask for the perennity of this measure? Yes, we are staying with the same measures that were in place as far as the people requesting asylum. But obviously, it's a situation that over the few years, uh, the, the, these people come irregularly to Canada. Uh, we're trying to find a way to uh, make sure that this situation is still anchored in our values and to work in good faith with our partner just south of the border. We will continue to have discussions, but at each step, we'll make sure that we're respecting uh, our principles and our values. Hi, Prime Minister Tom Perry, CBC. Um, as provinces start to reopen, testing and tracing is going to become more important. Now, we understand that that came up in your call with first ministers. What have you offered the provinces and territories in terms of support on that, and what more can you do? The federal government has uh, put forward a proposal that recognizes that 
increased contact tracing and increased testing are going to be key to a reopened Canadian economy. We need to make sure right across the country that we have uh, a strong capacity to respond wherever there might be a resurgence or, or uh, flare-up of COVID-19. And that means having significant resources at the uh, availability of all regions and provinces. So the federal government has offered uh, to invest in a national framework uh, to uh, lead the way on testing and contact tracing. Um, we are working with the provinces right now to ensure that uh, it works for all of them, but we're going to be moving forward on uh, ramping up massively our testing and our contact tracing. Okay. We know dans... that in an economy that is open, it is extremely important to answer quickly if there is a resurgence or flare-up of COVID-19 somewhere across the country. So the federal government has decided that we must increase massively our capacity of uh, doing uh, some contact tracing and some testing and to see who could have been infected. So we've offered uh, to uh, grow the capacity across the country uh, for the province uh, invest in a national framework uh, so that we have a pan-Canadian approach, and we know that will be essential. And on the border, um, when things do start reopening, uh, what, what kind of infrastructure do you want to see in terms of testing, in terms of tracing, I guess other things as well? What's it going to look like when we start allowing non-essential travel across the Canada-U.S. border? These are uh, ongoing questions. We've given ourselves another month before uh, we have to have uh, the right answers to those questions on non-essential travel. But even now, uh, we know that we need to do more to ensure that uh, travelers who are coming back from, from, uh, from overseas or from the United States as Canadians uh, are properly followed up on, are properly isolated, and uh, don't become further vectors for the spread of COVID-19. We're working closely with the provinces to ensure sure that uh, arrival of uh, people into Canada, uh, even now, but certainly uh, once, uh, once we get to a point where non-essential travel picks up again in the coming uh, months, I guess, uh, we need to have strong measures in place, and we're looking at those closely. Bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre, Christian Noël de Radio-Canada. Mr. Prime Minister, Christian Noël from Radio-Canada. I'm bringing you on the international uh, scene. There's a there is a petition saying that Canada is, uh, should not be uh, have a seat at uh, the United Nations because of questions on uh, uh, indigenous people, Palestine. How can Canada keep campaigning? And the fact that we are devised on this question makes us weaker. I think there's no division over these questions. Canadians all want the Canada as a strong voice on the international scene. And this is what we're looking for. Uh, the Security Council of the United Nations is a way to make sure that our values can be shared. And we are pushing uh, for a better collaboration with the different countries. And we will be able to do so with that seat at the United Nations. But it's a mean to continue the, uh, the impact of Canada in the world and, and not a goal in itself. Uh, as far as those who don't agree with our positions, uh, the uh, dictator Maduro is illegitimate and he is creating a crisis, a military crisis that, that is terrible in Venezuela, and that's sending refugees in every country in South America. And we do uh, care with all our allies and friends in South America to find a solution to this situation. The UN Security Council seat is a means for Canada conti to continue its strong advocacy and presence for our values on the world stage. Uh, we know uh, that there is a lot of reflection that needs to be had on how to handle this COVID-19 crisis and how to bring forward a better world in the coming years. I think when we reflect on the scale of this crisis, many people have compared it to what happened 75 years ago around World War II. Well, 
In the years following World War II, we created a range of multilateral and multinational institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank, the Bretton Woods institutions that uh, helped the world uh, over the following decades uh, tr develop tremendous prosperity and opportunity for, for people right around the world. 70, 75 years later, we have another crisis that is comparable in scale to that Second World War. And I think there need to be real reflections on how we move forward as a world, how we update and adjust our various multilateral institutions to better respond to the world we're becoming part of right now in a post-COVID era. Canada's voice is going to be really important, as it was around the forming of the Bretton Woods institutions, as it will be as we create a better, more prosperous, fairer world for everyone. And Canada having a voice at the UN Security Council will allow us to continue to be at the heart of those discussions as we move forward as a planet. Um, be more precise in French as far as the role of Canada playing uh, in the fight against COVID-19, is that useful for to promote your campaign? And there are some Canadians that also say that it's not unanimity. Well, we have managed this situation in Canada uh, in a very efficient way, but there's always more to learn uh, from our neighbors and our friends across the world. Uh, and the, uh, the G7, the G20, all these uh, multilateral platforms, uh, important, very useful to uh, understand and, and learn how we can uh, uh, cooperate in a safe way and how we can work together for the next step uh, in the fight against this virus. But at the same time, we must reflect uh, we often compare this crisis that we're living to the crisis that happened after World War II. So in the years that followed the Second World War, we created many institutions, international institutions, to guide us uh, in, in the years to come. And, and they worked very well and created prosperity. And after that, everywhere in the world. But now we must reflect of what will be the modifications, the improvements of these institutions that will bring us uh, throughout the 21st century. And if Canada can and must have a presence in these discussions, not only because uh, we manage very well uh, the economy in the crisis uh, and keep our principles and our values that are dear to us, but also because the, pressure, the next steps will be to build a world economy that will be more equitable, uh, more fair to anyone, everyone. And, and this is, we must have a strong voice. And that's why we are looking forward to have another mean to have a strong voice uh, at the international level. Morning, Prime Minister Kevin Gallagher, CTV National News. Uh, President Donald Trump is threatening to pull American funding from the World Health Organization and reconsidering his country's membership in that UN agencies. Now, some European countries have come to the support of the WHO. Where does Canada stand? Canada believes that multilateral institutions like the WHO are extremely important, particularly at a time of a global health crisis like this one. Uh, no global institution is perfect, and there are obviously uh, things we need to work on and things we need to approve about multilateralism, and that's uh, one of the reasons why Canada has been so incredibly active uh, over these past uh, weeks and months, including in this crisis, uh, to advocate for a rethinking and improvement of our global situations and our global institutions in line with our values. We will continue to do that. We will continue to support the WHO, even as we look for improvements to our multilateral systems. Um, China has actually pledged $2 billion for the WHO. And obviously, leading up to this, the organization has faced criticism for its handling of misinformation at the beginning of this outbreak coming out of China. So are there any concerns for you that there's such a uh, large influence in the term of uh, funding commitment 
from China to the WHO? I think there are always going to be reflections about uh, the relationships between the largest donors to uh, multilateral institutions and uh, the functioning of those multilateral institutions. And I think as we move through this crisis and particularly come out of it, uh, we will have to be asking questions about uh, the independence and the strength of those organizations to be able to uh, do the kinds of things that are absolutely necessary in keeping everyone around the world safe. Uh, that balance does need to be uh, looked at carefully. There will be some real questions around China, of course, uh, in the coming months uh, and years that need to be answered, uh, and we will be part of that. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. Earlier in your opening remarks, you commented on the Snowbird crash over the weekend. And I'm just wondering, have you since spoken to Captain Casey's family? Have they expressed concerns about the Snowbirds flying and whether or not you think they should be grounded? Um, I have uh, had a couple of conversations uh, over the past couple of days with the Minister of Defence, and I know uh, he and others are very closely engaged uh, with the families, and I uh, will, of course, be speaking to, uh, uh, to the family. Of, of Captain Casey and, and others. Um, I think there are very good questions being asked by a whole lot of people about, uh, uh, about safety right now, uh, first and foremost by the uh, RCAF. And there is going to be a proper investigation and we're going to allow them uh, to do their work before we make assumptions about what uh, might be the outcome of that investigation. Okay. Uh, I spoke many times to the defense minister this weekend after this accident. Um, and of course, I will talk to the families that are, impact, uh, that are concerned. But for now, we'll let uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force do their work, the investigation, uh, to understand how this could happen. Uh, and before we have some conclusions on safety of these aircraft. Border. President Trump says he's been taking the malaria drug hydrochloroquine for about a week and a half now, and he says it's a good preventive approach to getting COVID-19. I just want to get your thoughts on whether or not you think it is a good preventative approach. I will continue to follow advice of medical professionals and uh, implore uh, every Canadian to follow the best advice of our medical health experts. Merci. Merci. Merci.